Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for raising your health IQ with us in more than 130 countries around the world, making the exam room one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And we have a lot of work to do today. We're going to be talking about heart health and let's start with some facts. These are just mind blowing, absolute cold hard facts when it comes to heart health. In the United States, one out of every four people will die from heart disease. But it doesn't stop there because this year alone, heart disease will claim 659,000 lives. That is our mothers and fathers, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our loved ones, 659,000 lives. And you break that down, that is one person every 36 seconds. And the thing of it is, when it comes to heart disease and heart-related deaths, so many of these are preventable. But the question then becomes, well, how much of this is genetics? How much of this is food? What is really going on? We're going to get to the bottom of that and get your heart health pumping as healthfully as possible today. And the gentleman to help us do that is the heart healthy doc himself. Dr. Columbus Batiste, he is here. He is a plant-based interventional cardiologist and he will be using his skills. He will be using his expertise and his passion to make a difference and raise your health IQ. With that, we welcome Dr. Batiste to the exam room live. My friends, so good to see you. Likewise, it's great seeing you. I mean, I'm sad that we have to have the same conversation another year about the same issues of heart disease, you know? It just never seems to end this cycle. So that's why it's important, though, that we keep having these conversations because it is my sincere hope that with every one of these, we are opening some eyes. And the more eyes that get open, the more lives then get saved. So if you have a question for Dr. Batiste, to go ahead and pump that into the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we possibly can here today. And Dr. Batiste, I want to start with the question here. You have done now thousands of heart procedures, and you've been doing medicine for well over a decade, probably close to two decades at this point. From the time that you started, to where you are today. How much has your perception of heart disease changed in terms of how many of these cases were in fact preventable? Oh man, uh, you know, I'll tell you Chuck, over the years, what I've recognized, my whole evolution, the hidden truth has just been exposed on a repeated basis in terms of really the root cause of heart disease. But I've seen it just really explode. And the older I get, it seems the younger the patients are, which is the hard part and recognizing the fact that it is preventable is really scary. I'll tell you the worst thing ever is that when you dig through medical records as a physician or a clinician, you start to trace back through someone's evolution and you'll see, oh, just a touch of blood pressure, a touch of cholesterol, a touch of diabetes, a touch of kidney insufficiency, that all of a sudden these things begin to grow. And as the medical record thickens, you see event after event without any intervention regarding lifestyle. You see the medication list grow and grow and grow. And you wonder, man, what if I could somehow be like Tom Cruise in that movie Minority Report and go back in time and stop the crime before it happens, that I can intervene in someone's life and have the power and the influence to tell them, listen, if you begin to adopt this lifestyle, I'm not going to tell you that you're going to live forever, but I can tell you that your health span is going to be improved. I can tell you that your years of disability are going to be shortened. I'm going to tell you that you're going to enjoy life more. And that's where it's it's encouraging, but yet sad at the same point as I witness what people are going through without any intervention of lifestyle being uh, shared with them. And for me, it's it's not just the person. You know, I mentioned the the wives, the husbands, the brothers, the sisters, the parents at the top of the show. It's the family members who are going through this heartache as a result of this horrific disease as well. And that's something that can't be lost on you as a physician either. No, not at all. I mean, listen, I mean, my story for myself, it's well known, not to others out there, but I lost my dad to the ill effects of diabetes. And it forever changed the trajectory of my life and my career and the way in which I went through things. It had collateral damage that rippled throughout my, my family. And I was a grown man. So imagine having that collateral damage at the young forming years of, of children's lives. You know, I just lost a friend from colon cancer. I know we're talking about heart disease. And his son is in the same grade as my son, 10th grade. Now you imagine the, the loss, the burden financial, the burden on, on the mindset, the weight that it places on that young child. 
And that's really why with the work you're doing, the work PCRM is doing, the work that I am attempting to do is so important. Well, let's go ahead and try to raise those health IQs and do some important work today. Let's open up the doctor's mailbag, Dr. Batiste, and start answering some questions, my friend. The first one comes to us from John, and John is a keto questioner. He wants to know, if keto is so unhealthy, then why do so many doctors prescribe it for their patients? Yeah. You know, John, that's a great question. You know, one of the things I always start asking is, I was told early in training is, know what question you're being asked before you provide an answer. And so a lot of times doctors may be trying to answer the question of weight loss in general, as opposed to health promotion in general. And we also know that that's amplified by the fact that many physicians, they don't spend as much time embedded in the research of nutrition and lifestyle. They spend more time in the realm of medicinal aspects in in surgical interventions. And so what's the result of that? In many instances, there is just anecdotal recommendations based upon what they've heard or what they've they've uh, been reported in general terms. But when one digs down deep inside of the literature and you begin to ask a specific question, how can I best achieve the healthiest heart-related diet I can, there is no dispute. The evidence and preponderance of evidence regarding animal protein and specifically red meat and processed meats is extraordinarily profound. And it tells us about the risk for, for cardiovascular events, both stroke, hypertension, and heart disease and heart event and longevity. I love the way that you put that as far as just looking at it as uh, from, at weight loss is kind of this cure all. And I'll admit when I was overweight, that was my only focus was to lose weight. But then one of the privileges of doing this show has really been the ability to do those deeper dives that you were talking about. And so this weight loss journey for a lot of people that starts with, yeah, just getting that excess weight off then suddenly becomes the journey to reduce the risk of heart disease, reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, of cancer, prostate cancer that you were just talking about so many other things and it's all kind of tied together. Uh, it's so much more than just weight loss, which is why I, I just, I love the show and I love conversations with this. Um, you know, let's, well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Chuck, yeah. you know, one of the things with that, that's so powerful is the fact you just mentioned a lot of times, especially inside of our, our, our area, our niche of lifestyle, that people are beat up over the fact that they haven't completely transitioned and made that journey. And I acknowledge, I want everyone to do it hundred percent. But I always like to applaud the effort because that journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And so that first step for some may end up being keto or paleo as they start this journey of saying, I want to improve myself. But then they realize that, okay, this isn't the best way to improve my overall being. Yes, I may shed external. Externally, I may appear more healthy, healthfully, but internally, I want to be healthy. And so in order to, to achieve that internal health, that, that robustness, that's where you have to begin to dig deeper and look into the, the evidence and, and seek out information to figure out how I can be the best version of myself inside and out. Oh, man, I am pumped that you said that because I, it was just a couple of weekends ago, I was speaking to a plant-based weight loss group, and uh, I said something very similar to that, and their jaws hit the floor. I was like, guys, I really do not care how you lose weight. I honestly don't. It's about long ball here. You know, you're playing the long game. So the best thing long term is to shift over to that plant-based diet. But as you said, if it took keto to get you there, if it took Atkins to get you there, South Beach, whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. You're there now. Now it's long ball to keep it off long term. That's really when you're going to want to make that transition. And their jaws just kind of hit the floor. And, you know, I think that they were like, wow, you know, that makes me like this diet even more. I can't believe that here this guy is saying that. But the fact of the matter is I lost a tremendous amount of weight before I ever went plant based. But what the mm -hmm. plant based diet is doing for me now is not only reducing the risk of all of those chronic diseases we're talking about, but also keeping that weight off long term. And that is just it's clutch, you know, and I just I can't say enough about that. Um, we could be selfish and continue on with our own questions between the two of us. But let's yes. go on <laughs> and take one here from Sally. Sally's got a question regarding cholesterol, wondering whether good cholesterol can still cause a heart attack. Yeah. So no, that's a good that's a great question. Once again, as it relates, there's so much misinformation regarding cholesterol, good, bad, small, dense, bad cholesterol, large, buoyant, bad cholesterol. The over under on things is that when we look at the 
the bulk of the data that the lower your cholesterol is, the better for your longevity. And so good cholesterol has historic, has been described as the good transport cholesterol to help regress some of the plaque and stabilize the plaque. And so a high cholesterol level, not exorbitantly high, but a high cholesterol for women, what are we shooting for? Above 50. For men above 40, that, that's been shown to be protective. And there's a benefit that's there to your body. So you want that good cholesterol. How do you do it? It's not so much by diet. It's by activity. A good. This is one aspect of genetics that plays a positive role. Um, but in general, your main goal is to monitor the dietary cholesterol and saturate at that. That's what really is harmful. And so focus on the things that are modifiable in your life. And that's going to be the components of what you eat and how you move. And that's what's going to give you the best outcome regarding your cholesterol panel. You just mentioned genetics. So let's hop over to a question from Frank. Frank is wondering, what message would you have to somebody who has a strong family history of having heart attacks? Yeah. Well, I, I you have to kind of give me a, a leeway here, Chuck, because one of the things I oftentimes tell patients in my clinic is that, you know, if I bought your loved one bought you a car and you subsequently you found out that this car had some manufacturing defect, let's say just in theory. Well, you know that if you don't take care of that car, if you don't, if you speed and you roll over everything, you don't get the oil changed or if it's electric, you don't charge it up correctly and you use the wrong charging port that all of a sudden you're not going to be surprised if it breaks down. That's going to speed up the nature. And so a car that has an alleged manufacturing defect can still perform exceptionally well. It can still last the lifetime that it needs to. And so the same thing comes with, as it relates to heart disease. What the studies have shown is that the burden and the risk of a genetic imposed uh, event is very small. And you have much more power as it relates to what you choose to do in terms of what you choose, how you choose to think, how you choose to move, how you choose to live and eat. All those things play a more significant role than your genetics. Let's take a question here from Juliet. This is all that I love this one. What nutrients are most important for your heart? Oh, gosh. All of them. How about that? <laughs> all of them. So that's one of the key things that, that happens. And we all can get stuck in ruts, right? You want a diverse diet. You want the colors of the rainbow, right? So not Skittles, but you want you. Sorry, I shouldn't have used Skittles. You don't want those, those hard, chewy candies. You <laughs> want to have the colors of the rainbow inside of nature that they provide. Foods that will decay. Foods that will rot. These are foods that are alive. Now, where are some of my favorites? I love dark green leafy vegetables. Why? Because it's going to give you the dietary nitrates. So embracing those and having those, whether or not it's raw and slightly cooked, and that chewing can release the, the active components and really help uh, stimulate your arteries, lower your blood pressure. Having foods that are rich in potassium, which means the colors of the rainbow, your fruits and berries become extremely powerful. They lower blood pressure. Lowering blood pressure decreases strain on the heart. Decreases strain on the heart, decreases the chance that it can thicken and lead to heart failure or heart attacks and kidney failure. What's additional? You want your omega, so your flax become important. These are going to be helpful uh, 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 when we talk about oxidative stress and so for the body in general. Why do I love beans so much? Because beans are great. They give you resistant carbohydrates, which means your body doesn't count it as carbs and it gives you protein and it's giving you fiber, which all of these substances are, which lower the burden of your cholesterol, like our question before, and also help with cancer, like I mentioned with a good friend of mine. <laughs> Let's stick with beans here and take a question from Ava. Ava is wondering specifically about a type of beans, wondering whether black beans are in fact the most heart healthy bean. Yeah, I'd say the best bean is the bean that you will eat on a regular basis. It's going to be the best bean for you. So I'm not aware, and all joking aside, of any studies that have really randomized to show that the nutritional profile of black beans are superior to red beans or to pintos or varying, varying types of beans. There are, however, multitudes of studies that have shown the benefits of beans in that family of legumes in, in propagating healthful uh, lifestyles and behaviors. Follow up from her, how concerned should you be about the salt that is in a can of beans? Mm. I think you definitely should be aware. I won't say concern because concern elicits a response of fear 
and and triggers that of stress that I don't like. I speak against. That's something you want to do your best to avoid. But when we look at the sodium content, it's so important about packaged foods. And so there are a plentiful amounts of beans that either come inside of paper uh, uh, packaging where there's you don't have to worry so much about about any of the the toxins that are there. There are beans that are prepackaged that come with no salt whatsoever that you can find. Um, obviously the best and easiest approach is throw those bad boys inside of a pressure cooker, walk away and you're good to go. Or even a crock pot old style, it's gonna give you your biggest bang for buck when you buy them dried yourself and you can control the nutrients that are inside of it, right? Because remember the key thing when it comes to sodium, one teaspoon of sodium of salt is 2000 milligrams of sodium. You surpass it by one teaspoon. So just sprinkling it, adding it, all those things really magnify. And so cans of beans, you have to look at the serving size and there's multiple factors. Now, with that being said, would I choose a can of bean with some level of sodium over another processed or packaged food that's that's ultra refined? Absolutely. I choose a whole food time and time again over a prepackaged ultra processed food. So I love the question. I love that you're intentional on getting those important beans in. Are you a, a soak the bean and make it yourself kind of a guy? When I'm not being lazy, I mean, I'm going to be honest, Chuck, sometimes I'm lazy, you know, I mean, I'm not going to try and hide behind the cape of a white jacket or anything else and say, I'm super guy. Sometimes I'm lazy and I'm just getting that canned bean I just told you about. So I know that they have them out there, the no salt beans. I have my, my, my shelf is stocked, but when I'm on point and I'm not procrastinating for sure, Dude, just, it I takes me literally no time whatsoever to do it. The honesty is just tremendous. God bless you. Uh, you are you are a special kind of something, my friend. Um, okay, if you uh, Google what are the most heart healthy foods, you'll probably come across a list that has fish on them. So let's go ahead and take a question from Luna. Luna is wondering whether fish is good for the heart, despite the fact that it has a high amount of fat in it. Yeah. You know, when we look in general about the fish, I think everything you look at when you're comparing and saying, is it good or bad? It's relative and in comparison to. So is fish better than red meat? Is fish better than processed meat? Is fish better than these? Perhaps. But does fish come with a lot of toxins? Absolutely. Does fish in its preparation tend to lend itself towards excess uh, fats, even more so than what's contained inside of the fish itself? Absolutely. And so when I look at those components together, the mercury and dioxins and the pollutants that are there, when I look at the fact that I'm trying to get omegas that I can get from other substances, right? Like we spoke about the chia and the flax seed already, I'm going to choose those over fish. Now, so if your intent is to eat the fish for a therapeutic part to get, I want to get my omegas and so forth, then no, there's no reason whatsoever. If you're trying to transition to a whole food plant-based diet, you can get more of what you're looking for and what your body needs without the fish, without the harmful events that are there. So, um, but when you look at large scale data, you look at the lion trial and, and uh, study and so forth, and you're comparing pork and other red meats to fish consumption and exchanging it out, absolutely it shows that it's better for the heart than those substances. It's better for the heart than fast food, hamburgers and so forth when it's cooked and grilled. But um, I have not seen studies to say comparing it to none whatsoever. And we know the power of whole foods and fruits and vegetables and whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds for delivering the nutrients you need. And that brings us to the next question. This one will come to us from Lucy. And it's kind of along those same lines. She's been looking at the recent studies on olive oil. And she's wondering whether olive oil is, in fact, heart healthy. Or, as you just said, is it just the better of the options when it's better than, say, butter? Yeah. You know, I'm going to once again give you a personal <laughs> anecdote uh, uh, statement. I'll first off with the say. So there was a recent powerful say that came out. And it showed the power of olive oil and that it is actually health promoting. You look at extra virgin olive oil and its ability to to have provide anti-inflammatory effects. The problem with oils in general and the problem in America, which is a country we all live and embrace and love, is the fact that we do everything to the excess. And so we know that uh, a little bit of oil ends up being a lot of oil, which means a lot of calories. And we're looking at our calories. So once again, what's your question that you're asking? Is your question weight loss? Then oils may not be as ideal for you. 
And if you do utilize oils, it may be the fact that you need to be very measured in your amount and not very ad hoc, not very liberal, not very just, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just pour, sprinkle a little bit in or soak my bread up inside of it. So I have, I, I take, I take concern with patients over that. I also, inside the community I grew up in, so I grew up in, in an area called South Central Los Angeles. And the only time that there was fish, going back to the prior question, was deep fried fish that was breaded in cornmeal, had salt on it. You would put hot sauce on it. You'd have hush puppies. You'd have all these things that are deep fried. Is that helpful? Not even a little bit, not even close to being what's described. What about the oils? Well, the oils now, we're heating them oftentimes beyond their boiling point. And we're causing a reaction that's going to elicit free radicals and that can elicit issues with blood pressure and heart disease and cancers and so forth. Now, fortunately, extra virgin olive oil has some of the highest boiling points that are out there. But still, the amount of fat, the amount of calories that you're taking in, roughly 120, 226 uh, calories per tablespoon, which is a half of an ounce. So one ounce, nearly 250 calories it may not be worth it depending upon what question you're asking. So I, I would say be very mindful, be very aware of what you take putting into your body. You and I are not all that different, Dr. Batiste. Um, fried fish was also a staple of the Southern diet. Matter of fact, yes. we used to go out from time to time and catch our own fish in the Elizabeth River, come home and then fry them up for dinner and have hush puppies along uh, alongside of them. And then you, you top the fish with that Texas Pete hot sauce, man. So <laughs> you and I definitely grew up eating the same kind of cuisine as far as that is concerned. Um, it's funny, though, how I think back to it and, and I still kind of romanticize that, even though mm -hmm. I know how unhealthy it is. And then I kind of remind myself that it has more to do with the memories of that day than it does the actual fish, right? So who Absolutely. are you with? You were with your family. You're having a good time like that. And so I don't know, is that a conversation that you've had with patients who are like, well, I could never give up this or I could never give up that because that's what my family always eats, you know? Yeah. And and maybe you can kind of guide them to, well, it's your family that's most important here. It's not necessarily the food that's on the table. Yeah, no. I mean, I can speak to that personally just the same as you. I, I Some of the fondest memories I have were, as a child, were really going to these unhelpful places, right? And it's not the unhelpful places. It was the memories that were formed with my loved ones. But when you stop and you think from a historical standpoint, none of us eat the way our families ate, right? If you look at the evolution of our families over the generations and you go back four or five generations, I guarantee you they were not eating the way that we eat now. I guarantee you, right? Because the evolution is going to be a construct of the environment. Uh, and then that environment will play a substantial role in how you tend to live and the dietary habits. And so now as this transition is made out of necessity many times, as well as from a standpoint of comfort, as our food has been shifted and crafted and molded, that now it elicits this degree of repeated nature of going after, some might call it an addictive component, uh, it's hard to say that this is because of my family uh, cookbook, although it is. It's, this, is in, this is something that has been formed and crafted, and it's a circumstance of many of their environments. And so I think we have to get out the matrix. <laughs> I think we have to, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be Keanu, although I'm wearing my black, right? We got to get out the matrix and we look at what's going on here and, and look behind the scenes. Have you seen uh, the, the new movie, They're Trying to Kill Us, that documentary? I have. Powerful, I have. powerful piece of cinema. Is that not? Absolutely. Absolutely. John Lewis did a great job with that. Um, it's so information packed. It's one in which um, for those who haven't seen it and are about to, I encourage you to go ahead and go in with an open mind. You may have to watch it two, three times to soak it in. <laughs> there's with a the layered there. information yeah there there's a lot there uh we had john and keegan coon uh, the co-director on the show not too terribly long ago we got a lot of questions and feedback from viewers and listeners uh on that and uh so one of the questions that we, we got asked most often and i thought that it was laid out brilliantly in the film but you know we still have people wondering you know why is it then that african americans still have higher rates of heart disease if this information is now out there it's so that's a loaded question chuck i mean come on now you you i mean you want me really to answer that in like a quick uh, snippet no, we have all the <laughs> time joking. in the world my friend we can have ourselves an in-depth discussion here i would appreciate it so so i'll tell you um 
almost, you know, there's no, there's no idea that exists in this world that is inside of a bubble or in a silo, right? So there's, there's, there's uh, ideas that are happening at the same point in time. And so what's interesting is that as John was working on his movie, I and a colleague of myself were working on an initiative to educate the communities over this various thing called health disparities. And disparities are just like differences that exist when yet there are very similar access or so perceived. And so we entitled this slave food. And so the, the idea of slave food is not really a historical one, but oftentimes how we're shaped by our environments, how we're addicted based on our environments, how we're chained to disease and to habits sometimes based on our environment. And so when you look at the breath, I say everything always begins. Why do African-Americans, first, let's start with Americans. Why do Americans have some of the highest rates of disease globally? And this came to uh, was born to light in 2020. Well, I believe one of the components is stress. Uh, and you look at stress, the relationship with stress across every avenue, it increases the level of risk of diabetes, of high blood pressure, of heart disease, of stroke. And you look at a unique form of stressor that's faced by people of different genders, by persons of color, and that can be that of discriminatory stress. Uh, and when that discriminatory stress really kicks in, these are things that may not have to be overt. It's not things that just jump out at you. These can just be uh, small slights of people somehow thinking, you know, uh, David Williams out of Harvard developed this scale called the Everyday Discriminatory Scale. Uh, if someone maybe thinks that you're less intelligent, uh, if someone thinks that you may be inclined towards uh, a criminal activity, if someone thinks that somehow, um, you know, all of these different things that you shouldn't be in that role that maybe you're sitting in, these things have a, a microaggressive type of nature that erode at your health. And so many epidemiolo uh, epidemiologists and preventive medicine docs have gone into depths in research and looking at the role and the impact of this thing called discrimination or racial discrimination on the health outcomes. And there's a direct correlation between the level of high blood pressure, between all these uh, heart disease and cancer inside many communities of color. Now you amplify that with something that I characterize as nutritional stress, because what do most of us do when we get stressed out? And I say this inside I jokingly in different venues, but we go on a date with Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> we have a we have a little downtime with our favorite bag of chips or with our favorite fast food place, right? Because when we get stressed, this dessert spell backwards. And so all of a sudden we embrace this wholeheartedly. We begin this process of adapting nutritional stress to our bodies in order to give us a sense of calm, in order to give us a sense of relaxation from the weight and the burdens of life. And so now as I amplify this constant chronic stress, we all need stress, but I, I amplify a chronicity to my stress of everyday stress that's layered upon layered upon layered. And I add nutritional stress that's rich in oxidative stress and advanced glycation end products from like all the grilling and, and broiling and things of that nature. All of a sudden now this crucible of, of conflict breeds health disparities that are exorbitant. And I think one of the most telling signs of this is that even that's why health is even beyond. All right. I'm uh, say ouch, say ouch, Chuck, because I'm about ouch. to step on your toes. Yeah, man. Right? Do it. <laughs> health, true health goes beyond food. Hmm. Uh, and why, why would I say something like that? Well, when you look at the Adventist health study, and this just came to me, I actually have never said this since I have any talk before. When you look at the Adventist health study, you see that when the person moves from eating any and everything, uh, omnivor omnivorous diet down to a plant predominant diet that all of a sudden the disease burden begins to drop. But why is there still elevation inside the African-American community? Because it's still, it, although it declines, there still is elevation above other communities, above Caucasian communities. And why is that? Well, part of what my hypothesis is, is that it's a layer of, of additional stress that's there. That's then amplified into inability to perhaps get spiritual right? And the power of meditation and mindfulness to perhaps the inability based upon your social, your, your environment to exercise, to move because the safe environments may not be safe because our environment and our, our news reels are so filled with hate. It, it, it impacts our ability to love and release oxytocin, that love hormone that's been shown to have reparative functions on the heart inside, inside some mammalian anatomies and, and shown to lower the blood, the, the Im, reduce, improve the endothelial function. Uh, that it somehow begets the inability to have intimate relationships and something you and I spoke about before, it impairs our sleep because of stress. 
It impairs our ability to laugh. All these things in summary, they impair our ability towards achieving the health that is our inalienable right. And it's not longevity, but it's a health span. It's about a reduction inside of the dis disability years lived. And that's one of the key components when we ask the question, why do Black people in America still live sicker and die sooner? It's deep. No it's multi-layered. It's about social determinants of health. It's about our food. It's about everything as a whole. And that's in part what John Lewis and Kenan uh, were trying to, to outline inside of the movie was really is that there are layers to this that we all are obligated to address in our own way. And that could just be the way in which you interact with people and being conscious that I, as a provider, for me as a physician, I won't elicit implicit bias. Mm -hmm. That if I'm going to inherently think a person is a particular way just based upon their speech or their appearance, I'm going to consciously work as best I can to not do that. And I'm gonna give you an example of implicit bias for your listeners out there, right? And I'm gonna tell you what may be a positive one. I have a bad habit of thinking anyone from England is smart. When I, you know, when, when I hear them talk, I'm just mesmerized. And I think I'm speaking to the king or queen of England. And I sit there like, wow, the way they said that. And that is a bias inherently. It is a bias. I'm being facetious, but that is an inherent bias that I make the assumption that someone perhaps with no education doesn't, and education doesn't always mean that you're intelligent or not, but but it does uh, mean a little bit of something. I may give them <laughs> the power and this make a huge assumption in that moment. Of course, of course. Um, one of the, the examples of bias that really kind of got splashed across the headlines over the last eight months or so is in the NFL. And um, you look at what was happening with the concussion lawsuit that was going out there. And then suddenly... A large swath of America who had no idea that this was even happening learned of the term racial norms. And it turns out African-American players, they were just graded differently on this concussion scale of did they qualify to get these benefits? Um, and it was just mind blowing to me that anybody would be um, graded differently because they happen to be one race as opposed to another. That that just didn't compute to me. But I do think to the broader picture, what you were talking about, that stress, I mean, that's just one example of it that's out there that would add to it. Like that's that's a that's a major issue. And it cannot be limited to just the concussion settlement in medicine that these racial norms were being applied. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to tell you, there was a say that was done, and right now I'm blanking on all the full details. I can obviously get that for you. That was done looking at med students and saying, listen, do you think that there's a difference in the skin thickness between those of African descent versus those of Caucasian descent? And inside of medically trained students in the educational system, they resoundingly said, yes, there is a difference in the thickness of the skin based upon the color. The physical uh, thickness. The physical, they, they said, yes, they felt that there was a thickness and there is no difference, right? This is, was their impression of early med students. There also was a difference. You say, well, why would that matter? It translates over into so many different areas in terms of pain tolerance. When you look at, uh, and, and the fact that perception is, is that there is a higher pain tolerance inside of individuals of color. And that has its roots that extend back for centuries, and I won't go into the horrors that really kind of really were the platform for many of those things there. But these are some of the, the myths that still persist. And what's the result of it? Well, the result is you have this extraordinarily discordant disparity in terms of health, health outcomes and looking at where people of African descent have nearly 50 percent. 50% uh, of all African Americans have coronary artery disease. <laughs> That's huge. And you're and not only having it, you are more likely to die from it. That's, mm. that's, that's, that's crazy. And, and the worst of everything is that even when presenting in for care, you're less likely to get the appropriate medical medicine therapies, right? Just the medications. You're less likely to get procedures that I do on a regular basis, the stents and, and the angiograms and bypass surgery. You're, you're less likely to get that. You're less likely to get life-saving defibrillators. You're less, and, and, and it's mind boggling because as a physician, even though I understand the data exists, it's hard for me to believe 
from a, a when I put on my physician hat that anyone would not deliver standard care to someone based on their appearance or that they will allow judgments to impact the ability to render that care. But mm. study after study after study really validates that this happens. And unfortunately, even as a physician, I have seen this on occasion. Mm. I have seen it when patients have come to see me as a second or third opinion that I begin to scratch my head. Why wasn't a particular therapy rendered? Forget about the therapy of lifestyle, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I see is there's disparity across the board with everyone of every ethnicity, <laughs> that no one is delivered the therapy of lifestyle like what they should. But when I look at pharmaceutical and, and uh, 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 surgical interventions, that there is a disparity that's there. And so it is real, unfortunately. I am sad to report that this still exists in 2022. You, the, the craziest thing about this, I mean, there's so many crazy things, but one of one of the other mind blowing things is what was pointed out recently to me as well is like, even when you have somebody like a Serena Williams, yes. you know, her health outcomes are projected to be less than the ordinary uh, white woman's just because of the color of her skin. We're talking about Serena Williams, the yeah. greatest female tennis player to ever grace the face of the earth, still facing those same challenges. And then you want to talk about just bias. And it's like, what in the holy world is happening here? Like, how is this even possible? And then I hear you talk about medical students believing that the, the, thickness of a person's skin differs because of the race that they are. And it's just like, is this really happening? Is this, is this really happening right now in 2022? Sadly, from what you're saying, the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that's why these discussions, that's why the podcast about lifestyle, the pot, the awareness that's being brought, I'll tell you, I was having this discussion too this past week and they said, well, you know, don't you think doc that things are changing? I said, they are, but do I think things have resolved? No, not even a little bit, not even a little bit that they have completely resolved. And I gave them a specific analogy of myself and I, they were speaking about, well, why do you always try and come off so quote unquote polished? I don't know, Chuck is like, he's not polished. You know, why do you come <laughs> off and, and not show a little anger, a little, a, little, a, little, a little intensity or whatever else? And I said, you know, because the perception is that as a male of African descent, I may be perceived as hostile. I may be perceived as angry and that may impede. They were like, no, that wouldn't happen. And I gave them a prime example of something during my career in leadership of having a discussion with others around the table that didn't look like me. And I, I lost my awareness for a moment. I got impassioned, didn't yell. I didn't use profanity. I got impassioned and that came back to bite me. And so that still exists in this day and age that people are forced to kind of wear masks and they're, if they're forced to, to suppress certain things, which is a level of stress. And this is what I speak to as I describe everyday discriminatory stress and the, and what the impact that has on your inside, your well being, your resiliency. And so we have to find ways in which we can build this resiliency up through our nutrition. We have to build the resiliency up through our lifestyle by embracing individuals where we can have relationships, right? That where they understand us. And so I can, I can call up Chuck and have a great conversation and he empathizes with me and we talk and we can talk sports and everything. That's how I build resiliency. That's how I build resiliency. And th that's a component of us finally breaking through the bonds. Now, once we do that, now we have to turn our attention to changing the tide of what's transpiring that still exists and persists inside the country. Facts, man. And, and look, you also, you have a lot of polish. Okay. I, I should call you pledge because you got so much polish, right? I'm not saying that you're smooth. Are you, like, are you trying to talk about my head? Come on now. Don't try to Come make this up. It's not doc. Don't okay. Try, right. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Man, shoot. I was about to like pay. I was going to compare you to Donnie Simpson. And then you want to talk about hair. Come on. Now. Oh, look at you knowing who Donnie Simpson is. Well, my wife worked with him for years. Come on, man. Really? Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, you shoot, you, listen, you shoot for the moons. If you miss, what? You'll be amongst the stars. That's, right? that's that, his, Donnie, that was his tagline. That's Donnie, man. Yeah. His son is his son is amazing, too. But we'll talk more about that uh, yes. off air. Uh, the, the, I mean, just what, what an amazing family they are. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's talk uh, nutrition here as we kind of close things up. Let's take a few more rapid fire uh, help for everybody here. Um, and let's start with breakfast. Most important meal of the day. So say. 
many people. What is the ideal heart healthy breakfast in your opinion, doc? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's one that ultimately is going to result in being unprocessed and it's going to, it's going to be still comprised of whole foods. We oftentimes think that that breakfast has to be some form of a cereal, that breakfast has to be a smoothie, but breakfast can be anything. It can be a bowl of greens and beans and, and, and brown rice. It can be sweet potatoes. Um, you know, but for those of you who are on the go, it may be in the smoothie. It may mean some form of a, of a pre-baked uh, breakfast cookie. And what I mean by breakfast cookie, rich in bananas and berries and, 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 and oats that give you the fiber and so forth that are compiled together for you. So you can get some nutrients. All of us are breaking. All breakfast means is you're breaking the fast. So whether you're breaking the fast first thing in the morning or you're breaking the fast closer to noontime, it's a period of time after a cessation, allowing your body to get rest and recover that you're now delivering to it the nutrients it needs to perform. Uh, so that's the key is that you want to perform at your, your utmost. And in order to perform at your utmost, you have to feed your body the premium food, fuel. And that's the goal. That's the key with any breakfast. And pro tip for those breakfast smoothies, make them the night before, before you go to sleep and just have a blender ball in whatever bottle you've got it in. And then just shake it up in the morning as you're walking out the door. You are good to go if you're crunched on time. Uh, crunched on time, we got time for just a couple of more. Um, here's an interesting one from Lewis. How long could it take to unclog blocked arteries? Yeah. So Lewis, this is actually a complicated question. And so it's not even so much about unclogging the arteries. What it's about is stabilizing the arteries. Your arteries are very dynamic and the blockages inside them are very dynamic. So the expectation isn't for you to go from 100 to zero or from 90 to zero. The expectation is for you to have just enough regression of the blockage to improve the blood flow where you no longer have symptoms. Uh, the goal is for you to have just enough regression of that blockage. So now you improve the blood flow. So in that way, and you stabilize the lining of the vessels so you aren't prone towards having a heart attack because all we kill it, care about, feeling better, living longer without heart attacks, right? And so this is what the power of nutrition is. It's about helping you feel better and live longer without heart attacks. And so studies like the, the Lifestyle Heart Trial, like the Mount Abu uh, Heart Trial, like uh, the, the, the case series by Dr. Esselstyn and by Dr. Furman and by many hundreds of others, have shown that literally this can happen within weeks, that you begin the process of becoming chest pain free, that you can become the process of stabilizing the vessels that are evidenced by lowering of the cholesterol. So there is power inside each and every moment, each and every bite that you take towards this, this goal. I love the way that you put that it can happen in a matter of weeks. I was just speaking with a woman recently who had, I mean, just this ridiculous turnaround. I mean, you're talking about so overweight, had diabetes, had lost her vision, was just really headed down this unhealthy, unhealthy hole. But then, you know, she was like, I was like that for 30 years. But then, but then within the matter of three months, she regains her health and I'm crunching numbers. I was like, three months versus 30 years, that's literally one 120th the amount of time. <laughs> so when people are like, oh, it's gonna take forever to do this, I'm never gonna do it. It's like, no way, man, it is way faster than then all of the damage that has been accruing over the years you just have to take that first step uh two more what nuts are the most heart healthy nuts yeah i think if we look at nuts once again you're going to look at things like walnuts brazil nuts hazelnuts are going to be your your top choice almonds are good but when you're looking at nuts here's the key right you can't be a snack a snackaholic like i i was formerly right <laughs> you have to make sure you put this into the context we're talking about no more than about three tablespoons of raw unsalted nuts, right? So your best bet for those of you who are snackaholics like I was once upon a time is at best that you're going to sprinkle them on top of your oatmeal or on top of your salad or, or as garnish, as opposed to you taking handfuls and just ingesting them. Um, and so that's typically what I, I recommend. So doing, you have to be careful with the roasted ones because they're oftentimes pan fried. And so you're adding oils on top of everything else and salt. And we already spoke about the perils of salt in terms of longevity and in terms of the damage to your endothelium and in terms of your body from head to toe. So nuts have a place, they're powerful, but you have to always, look with, as with everything, make sure that you're going in very mindful. And final question, I love to end on a high note. This one comes to us from Rachel. Rachel writes, Dr. Batiste, if someone has had a heart attack and they've had two strokes, is it too late for their health to improve? 
Mm. That's where the, the power I believe in what we're doing is hope. And so what I would tell you is that, no, it's never too late for hope. It's never too late for a power of change. And that's one of the beautiful things that's been demonstrated inside studies. It's not just about making a change uh, It's or about the age or about the longevity of your disease. And this is what Chuck alluded to. It's about your intense, your intentional nature. If you're going in a hundredfold, there's a chance that you're going to receive it back a hundredfold. And so it's not saying that there's somehow some sort of magic dust or power powder here that by adopting a whole food plant-based diet and sleeping and exercise, et cetera, et cetera, that all of a sudden everything is going to dissolve and go away and you're going to feel like you were five years old. But there is a chance that you can move back the dial as it relates to the terms of your, your disease state. Maybe it's not back to zero, but maybe it's back to, to 10%, 20%, 30% instead of being at 70, 80, 90%. And there's power in just those small movements. So I don't want you to be discouraged out there. Don't be discouraged if you're not having the same results as someone else who says that their cholesterol dropped by 100 points and they lost 200 pounds and all you've lost is 10 pounds and all your cholesterol has dropped is 10 points. That is still powerful. And you have no idea what it's doing on the inside to preserve your life. Uh, so I would tell you, no, it's not too late. No, it's not too late. And no, it's not too late. Be intentional. So you're saying it's not too late. It's not that. too late, Chuck. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, but it is too late to ask a question on today's show. But if we didn't get to yours, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on the upcoming episode. Uh, but Dr. DeBatiste can't let you go also without asking about what you have coming up uh, with Chef AJ. You, you two are teaming up. She's a friend of the show for a really exciting project this month. What's up? I'm going to tell you, she is incredible. So I'm about to jump on her back. Not literally now. Don't tell my wife now. <laughs> and, and we are going to go ahead and we're going to kick off for uh, Heart Health Month, for Black History Month. We are joining forces together the first week, January 31st through the end of the week, in uh, first week of February. And we're going to be interviewing the likes of Jasmine Leva and John Lewis, who spoke about Milton Mills and and Koya Webb and 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 many out there. Bobby Price, a farm pharmacist out there. And so I am so looking forward to this opportunity to collaborate with her. If any of you are familiar with Chef AJ, you know that she is incredible. She's an incredible woman. She's an incredible speaker, an incredible host of her show. And so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, love me some Chef AJ. Love me yeah. some Chef AJ. She is a woman that truly wants to make a difference and improve people's health the same way that she has improved her own. You know, yes. I always use the term pay it forward. And that's kind of exactly what it is that she's trying to do. Um, so I'm really happy that the two of you are teaming up and we're going to put links to everything uh, in the episode notes in the show description. So everyone here, all of the exam roomies can go check that out uh, as well. And of course, your website, uh, slavefood.org. Uh, you're talking a little bit about that earlier in the program. That's 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 pretty cool. And then your personal website, thehealthyheartdoc.org. Phenomenal resource. I love the, the bio that you had written on there. You talked about that as well a little bit on the show today. But your story and the reasons why you do the things that you do today as far as trying to educate your patients and educate our viewers and our listeners today. Um, it's a very personal journey. And so for you to be able to carry that emotional weight with you and channel that into something so positive like you're doing now, I think is just absolutely fantastic. So my hat is off to you. Good, sir. Appreciate you. I'm just trying to follow in your uh, footsteps and the rest out there at PCRM and I'm um, looking forward to great things. Great things. Pleasure being on with you again. My man, I'm just a squirrel in your world. You're trying to follow in my footsteps? <laughs> Please <laughs> give him a follow. He is on Instagram at Healthy Heart Doc, Dr. Columbus Batiste. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate you. If you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and like this or subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to check us out on Apple Podcast or Spotify, wherever it is that you get your podcast from. And when you subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee, please also leave a five-star rating. And for today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you one more time to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen and to Dr. Batiste for sharing all of his wisdom with us. And for everyone at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for tuning in. Until next time, keep it plant-based.